regular meeting June 13th at 1802. Director Branch, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call of board members. All are present with the exception of Director Fox, who is absent and excused. He cannot join us by telephone. is on a flight. Uh, any additions or deletions to the agenda? I have one. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, motion to approve. So moved. Or second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, agenda. Approved. Uh, next item to, will be to review the May 9th special meeting minutes. matter this month is uh, that we have finally gone a long way in getting our new chart of accounts established. They're not quite finished yet, so we're not handing out the normal monthly report, but next month we'll get the normal monthly report, but in a new format that Chief developed, uh, and it's going to reflect our new chart of accounts. Uh, we do have a, a somewhat of a new procedure that we've developed, and that is that uh, according to the account that we hired a new account, he's recommended that the board uh, look at all the individual expenditures um, for each month, all the checks that are signed. But since at least two board members already signed checks, and since putting these out to every board member might be a little bit, you know, maybe a little bit overkill, um, I've thought of the idea of having the treasurer look over the individual, what you call warrants, I guess. Uh, look over the individual expenditures. The treasurer will also be one of the directors who signs the checks as part of our new thing. So I will take on that responsibility of being one of the directors that signs checks unless I'm absent. And if I am, uh, Marie will notify somebody else to do it, probably the president. Um, so, yeah. Or whoever the president designates and whoever that person designates and so forth and so on. Um, so we have the new chart of accounts. We have a uh, uh, new way of looking at expenditures. Our audit is moving right along. It will be done on schedule for us to approve uh, at the July meeting uh, so that we'll meet the July 31st deadline. Um, we also talked about the idea that Maybe a surprise too. I don't know. I forget whether you were in the room of having the chief um, do a portion of the financial report during the board meeting, so that he can explain more of the details of what's going on during the month. And uh, if that's a surprise, I'm sorry. Somebody, Marie and I discussed it at least. So anyway, we can talk more about that. But since the chief is the one who has uh, his hands on the day-to-day -day operations, uh, it might be helpful for him to. Uh, include anything that he wants to include in, in the financial report uh, for the future. Uh, so other than that, uh, the only other thing I have is to uh, uh, move that the ex monthly expenditures for May of $137,615 be approved by the board. Okay, is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, that will take us to the fire chief report. Okay, uh, and there it is. Uh, um, so for uh, the month of May, we had uh, a total of 93 calls, and which included uh, two structure fires and, and uh, three other fires. Um, 
a uh, total of 43 uh, EMS calls. So, uh, business has started, uh, unfortunately, to pick up a little bit more for the summertime. Uh, in fact, uh, and since the 1st of June, uh, we've, we've been um, very busy, uh, you know, and uh, that's continuing at this time with uh, not only with our own our own calls, but also with assisting our neighboring departments as well. Um, the, uh, we were fortunate during the month that uh, the, the two structure fires that we had were both caught uh, fairly early. Uh, total fire loss was only $2,500 for the month uh, from a chimney fire. Um, the, uh, moving on to you know, the, the issues that we're looking at this month, one of the biggest ones, uh, you know, the uh, Insurance Services Organization, or ISO, that we've been uh, really looking into uh, the issue of fire insurance costs uh, for the community. Uh, the ISO, for the first time, has revised their, uh, their schedule um, of how they evaluate fire departments for, um, you know, determining the protection class, the first time since 1981. And uh, I've just completed going through all of the new uh, schedule that will be the one that will be tested on uh, the next time that they uh, re-rate the district and looked at uh, where we stand with the, um, you know, the, the various factors that they measure uh, in that. Uh, so the first section that they look at is, uh, is dispatch, and uh, even though the dispatch center that we utilize is, uh, is not a, a uh, part of the fire department, it, it gets uh, graded and then um, you know, that, that is applied to, to a total of 10% of the, of the to total um, rating for the district. Uh, in the past, uh, dispatch had received 100% uh, credit, so uh, they were doing actually very good in terms of uh, you know, meeting the standards uh, that they needed there. Uh, but they have completely revised that to now uh, be based more on the technology, including having automatic vehicle locators on all the fire engines, having the ability for dispatchers to know where the fire engines are at all times, uh, be able to dispatch the closest unit. And those are all of the same things that we've been trying to get implemented down at dispatch over the last uh, six months. Um, but. Uh, what we've found, unfortunately, is that uh, uh, disp the Jeffco dispatch is, is not going to be prepared to make any of those changes uh, for at least the next, uh, they're, they're talking two years to three years out. Um, and that obviously is going to be uh, a pretty major factor in, in you know, how we uh, are able to provide automatic aid and how we are able to cover uh, those areas of the district that we've been been working to get covered with automatic aid. Um, the fire chiefs are meeting to discuss that now. We've uh, met a couple of times that we're trying to come up with alternatives to, uh, you know, how are we going to be able to provide better uh, dispatching to maintain that the good uh, rating that we've got and to improve those um, areas, the class 10 areas, uh, to a better fire insurance rating. Uh, moving into the firefighting side of things, uh, fire flow is one of the things that they look at and uh, that requires a, a, that we have the ability to pump 3,500 <coughs> gallons a minute, which we do, so that's one area we'll, we will actually score very well on. Uh, the automatic aid, again, on the other hand, we're going to get uh, basically zero points for because of the problems with dispatch. So that's, uh, that is going to be a, a major factor that's going to negatively impact the next time that we are we are evaluated. Um, staffing is another one uh, which because we have uh, you know cut the positions the full-time positions that we have uh, we're going to see a decrease in the in our credit there um, and then the next section is uh, deployment where we look at you know are the fire stations in the right location and can we uh, supply enough fire engines quickly enough to fires throughout the district. Uh, and that is another area where we have a, a fairly significant risk of, um, of uh, losing, uh, losing ground on that particular um, uh, section. Um, hose and equipment is one where we will actually probably meet uh, all of the standard, but then the next one that we look at 
Uh, the ISO requires us to have at least one spare engine or reserve engine uh, for up to, you know, for the department up to eight fire engines. The, we don't have a reserve engine. Uh, there was one up until a few years ago when that was retired. Uh, and the biggest problem that we have with that is that you know, every time we have uh, one of our engines go in for service, uh, we essentially take a station out of, out of service until that's repaired. Um, and we had uh, one of our engines, our, our main frontline engine, uh, had an engine problem this uh, past week, so it was out briefly. Every time that happens, we essentially have to temporarily close the station until that, that uh, apparatus is repaired again. Uh, the next section that they look at is uh, service companies, which are, are the equivalent of ladder companies. Now, obviously, we don't have a requirement to provide uh, ladder trucks because we don't have tall buildings, but they do require that we have either rescuers or additional pumpers to meet that standard. Uh, and again, we don't. Uh, we have a, a minimum amount of uh, equipment beyond the you know the basic uh, four engines that we provide. The next section, uh, training. The, um, this was an area where the last time the dis district was created, uh, the district did very, very poorly. Uh, that was about uh, eight years ago or so, nine years ago. And, um, you know, I think that we've made a lot of progress since then, uh, but we probably have only overcome about half of what we need to in order to, you know, meet the requirements that they have uh, for that area. Uh, for training. Um, one of the biggest impacts that we're going to have uh, is, you know, and, and I'm, I was going to be bringing this up here after this section, is that uh, due to our budget situation, I'm, I'm now recommending that we not uh, fill the training officer position uh, because we would, you know, in all probability, be uh, laying that position back off again at the end of the year. Uh, so it obviously doesn't make a lot of sense for us to to refill that vacant position uh, knowing that we don't have the money to, to sustain it. Uh, and that is going to put uh, quite a bit of an impact on our ability to continue to provide uh, good quality training. Uh, I do have some plans for how we can uh, you know, make the best of that situation though. And uh, you know, that, uh, again, I'll cover that after we finish the insurance section here. Uh, pump hose and ladder testing is the next thing they look at. Uh, we will receive full credit for the hose and ladder testing. However, uh, three out of the eight rated uh, apparatus we have do not pass um, uh, pump tests. They uh, have not for many years, so uh, we would obviously be uh, uh, dinged pretty hardly hard in that. The biggest one there is the, is also the uh, water supply credit the ability to provide those uh, tankers. And um, that is, uh, again, one of the areas that I think that we're reaching a, a fairly critical situation with in that, you know, of the four tankers that we have, uh, two are 25 years old now. Again, those are two of the vehicles that don't pass pump test. And, uh, you know, their uh, performance is, is well below uh, what is necessary to deliver water in a timely manner. I think that we're going to have, um, uh, you know, probably a difficult time, uh, even even now with all four ta tankers in credit in the service. I doubt that we would pass the the uh, test for um, delivering water with those tankers. Um, Um, another area that uh, I know that we're we're going to see a decline in our in our rating is going to be in the fire prevention side, and again, the, you know that was due to the uh, the layoff of the of the fire marshal's position, which is going to impact our uh, our rating as well. So overall, I would say that at this point, if uh, if ISO were to come in right now and, and grade us on the new schedule, uh, we would probably you know, see a decline uh, from from a class five even at this time, uh, and uh, would probably be very fortunate if we were even able to maintain a class six. Um, 
So that's that obviously is going to be one of the situations that we're going to have to really look at very carefully and how we're going to try to allocate resources in the best manner to maintain the, the level of service to uh, meet uh, the ISO requirements. Chief, how do you feel that they'll be coming in for an evaluation? I believe that they're due next year. It's every 10 years, and if I remember correctly, the last one was in 2004. Okay, uh, the next issue um, is also one that is not uh, uh, very good news. Um, we have uh, the preliminary assessments from Park County and Jefferson County, and um, the, the preliminary assessments come out in May, and then people have the opportunity to appeal and uh, have those assessments reduced. Uh, so the, the, from the May numbers, we're going to see a decline uh, before the final numbers are provided to us in December uh, based on how many of the appeals uh, for property values are successful. Uh, the preliminary numbers, uh, Jefferson County is down 3.4% and Park County is down 6.75%. So overall, um, we're looking at, uh, you know, with no successful challenges, we're looking at another cut of about $45,000 from the budget. Uh, last year, uh, appeals brought that, uh, that number down by an additional 3%. And so we'd be looking at an additional probably twenty dollars to $30,000 additional cuts uh, going into 2014 at this time. And again, that is why, uh, you know, my recommendation at this point based on the fact that you know the, the reduction in the budget for next year is going to be somewhere between um, thirty five and sixty five thousand um, dollars you know that uh, essentially is another position and so at this point I am recommending that we not uh, fill the deputy chief position and that we uh, start to scale back some of the training programs that uh, you know would, would normally be assigned to that position. Um, the, the, uh, with that, what, uh, what we are looking at and, and what uh, I, am, I am planning to do is uh, to uh, stop recruiting any new untrained uh, volunteers and not conduct a recruit academy uh, for next winter. Uh, we were very successful in this past one in bringing in uh, 15 really good volunteers. And we are also getting ready to uh, interview uh, six more uh, firefighters that have experience that are basically uh, either paid ambulance personnel or paid firefighters at other departments or come, are moving into the community with experience. But basically, uh, we're going to try to save money on uh, not conducting a recruit academy next year uh, by basically trying to just work on uh, continuing to uh, re retain the existing volunteers and uh, only take vo volunteers that already have uh, the training that we would not be uh, needing to uh, put through the 200-hour academy to, to bring on board. What's the current number of volunteers? Uh, we currently have about 59 volunteers, which uh, is a, a very solid number for us. I think that we can get through the next year without uh, really feeling like uh, we're short on personnel at all. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, we, we recruited more folks this year than, uh, than we really had budgeted for, which is a great thing in terms of having the personnel on board. But uh, you know, even though volunteers work for, for no money, uh, we have to equip them and, uh, and that does cost us. So uh, we're gonna try to keep that uh, cost down. Uh, one good thing that we did uh, find out just uh, the other day is, is that uh, we did receive uh, the uh, FEMA grant for $72,500 for training and uh, that uh, fund is actually going to help take up the, the shortfall in having that other position because we will be able to essentially hire uh, people to do some of the training work. Um, the, a very small portion of that will go to that. that. The other thing that that grant um, is designed to do would be to 
fund uh, putting up to six of our members into paramedic school. And uh, that would actually be a, a great uh, thing for us. It, it would help quite a bit with retention of our personnel, and it also would help us uh, by um, you know, increasing the number of paramedics that we have available among the, the uh, volunteers by a considerable amount. So uh, that, that actually was, was the bright uh, spot in the week for uh, the financial situation. You mentioned that um, we're not training driver operators, but the grant does cover that? Yes, the, uh, the other thing that the grant is going to cover uh, is uh, putting on a Firefighter 2 class. Uh, which has been several years since we've we've conducted one of those. Uh, that's essentially the second class that firefighters should be going through following uh, completion of their rookie academy, which is Firefighter 1. And then more importantly, the driver operator class. Uh, currently, there uh, there's only one member of the department who actually has a driver operator certification. Uh, and obviously, a number of our folks you know, are, uh, are competent at driving fire engines and, and competent at pumping, but, um, you know, the, the skill level varies from individual to individual. Uh, and uh, conducting the uh, driver operator class would bring everybody up to, uh, you know, the certification level and uh, would ensure, a, you know, a higher level of capability in all of those personnel. And in addition, that's also uh, both that Firefighter 2 program and the Driver Operator program are two of the pieces that have been missing in the department's uh, training program in the past as far as ISO rating goes. Uh, so in the past, the department has gotten no credit for having a certified program for either of those. With this program, you know, we'd be able to put those in place. So uh, I think that... Uh, I think it's going to be very worthwhile taking the, the effort that we put into the Recruit Academy and, uh, and shifting that over into uh, Driver Operator and Firefighter 2 for this coming winter. Um, in the meantime, between now and then, uh, our plan is kind of to drop back a little bit into more of a maintenance schedule over the, over the summer, uh, continue to work on just regular, uh, regular training drills and um, not conduct any additional classes, in part because, uh, you know, the tremendous amount of time that all of our volunteers have been putting into uh, to doing that recruit academy, you know, each, uh, each evening that they meet, each weekend that they meet, we have 12 or 15 volunteers uh, required to come in and conduct that training for them, uh, for, the, you know, to, for them to get the uh, hands-on training that they need for that. So, uh, by by taking that uh, burden off of the volunteers right now, we might uh, avoid a little bit of burnout that uh, we we're probably getting pretty close to with uh, many of our folks putting in as much as 100 hours as a volunteer in, in a single month. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of skate a little bit until uh, until the fall, and then hopefully get those uh, the firefighter two and driver operator programs in place. Okay. Um. I was going to tell my colleagues, uh, Lieutenant Parks approached me a couple months ago and said that this new recruit class was just as the chief said, is a uh, very good class. Uh, they wanted to see if there was any way I could get get them into Denver's Burn Building because we have one of the, uh, one of the better ones, a uh, quality one, but it's pretty expensive. Um, I was actually able to get our chief to waive the fees for two full days out there, two full eight hour days. Uh, the only mistake I made is I was dumb enough to volunteer my own time. Uh, That's what the 10th thing you're Yeah, <laughs> 16 hours in the third building and about did me in. Uh, uh, myself, uh, three other Denver officers, including a former drill master out there, who is one of the wildland co op guys we've got working here with Elk Creek through Den with Denver Fire. Uh, they also donated their time. Uh, and the one being the former drill master is, I think, what got our division chief safety and training to allow us to, to waive all the fees and have us be the safety officers. Uh, so we saved the district a lot of money, got them the quality training, and I got to say, like the chief said, I was impressed with these recruits. Uh, they looked as good as some paid recruits that we would hire and run through our academy. Um, and then the other volunteers and the other paid staff that came out to instruct that day, 
uh, we were able to use uh, not only our live burn building, uh, our roof ventilation prop, and our forcible entry and search props that we have out there because we had enough uh, Denver firefighters that came out there to donate their time to help uh, run it, as well as the paid staff and the volunteers that came out to help and assist too. So uh, it was two very good days, and as the chief was saying, there's a little burnout on everybody's part at the end of that. So. Um, I'm not that worried about us not having another recruit class because this class, I'll tell you, they, they shined out there. So the volunteers we have now, we're lucky to have the skill level that they have. Um, so that's probably the only good news in all this bad that we can't keep maintaining because I think this group is, we, we're lucky to have them. We've got a good group and I was glad we were able to do our part to help save the district some money, get the quality training. Um, and then the co-op, the Denver officer firefighters that helped with that are also the ones that are cross-training here to help staff our wildland rigs so we can generate some revenue on these deployments. Even though right now we're out and everybody's out, either through Denver or through our co-op here. <clears throat> we thought we had enough guys, but uh, this fire season already has depleted that. But I think it's a good program we've got there and uh, that all worked very good. So hats off to Alex and Jamie for putting all that together. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. can help out other than I found out. I've been doing this a long time. 16 more hours in that burn building <laughs> burned me out. <laughs> but uh, but it was good. It was good all the way around. So I'm glad we were able to get all that to work. And, I, and it's, been, uh, it's been really good having them come up and work with us on the wildland too and, uh, and attend our wildland training. I think that that's a, a program that uh, we'd like to see continue and expand in the future um, you know, because uh, obviously we both, uh, both departments have something to share there. Because yeah. it works good for Denver because we're single resource, just get deployed out of Pueblo, out of Ross when they deploy. It doesn't matter where they go with whatever department or whatever, they will hear uh, cross training with all the Elk Creek equipment. That gets paid for by the federal government when they backfill in Denver and then we get wildland professional firefighters too to staff our rigs to get out and help the other uh, communities. Plus, it gets our rig out so we can generate revenue to help with our budget gap too. So it's another one of those win-wins other than uh, we just didn't have enough bodies. So, but that's just this unique problem we're having again this year, unfortunately. So. And unfortunately, that's the, the right now that's the case with all of the, you know, virtually every department in the state. Uh, you know, they, uh, any, any resource that is available is, uh, is on fire right now. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's an unfortunate thing. Um, you know, obviously, I think everybody's been hearing the news about uh, what's going on, and, and uh, I don't think that uh, we're out of the woods anywhere near at this point. What's the, the current situation on Platte Canyon? Uh, have you been monitoring Platte? Yeah, last time I heard it was uh, one acre and had a line built around it. Okay. One acre? Yeah, yeah, one acre. Okay. So hopefully we'll be we'll be getting that one back here fairly shortly. Knock on wood. So. And we're conscious. The chief's conscious about making sure we keep enough stuff here. So only that's another good reason about utilizing these other resources for staffing, so that we don't deplete anything here. Definitely. Yeah, we still. So, so with Evergreen happening recently. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I think that's everything. Any questions for the chief? Okay. Uh, level of service committee report. Okay. Um, I think uh, you know we, we were hoping to uh, come up with uh, recommendations uh, this month, but I think that uh, actually we're still fine tuning some of that. So um, this is going to be more along the lines of a, of a status report for um, you know what uh, you know what we've uh, looked at at this point to now. Um, you know, the, uh, the level of service committee was, was looking at how to measure uh, the service that we provide to the public and how to, uh, you know, formulate a plan to maintain uh, a good level of service to the public uh, moving into the future. Um, the, uh, as we did that, we lo looked at a number of different ways that, uh, you know, we could either measure either quantifiably or uh, just in terms of, um, you know, objective uh, factors of, of how well do we do uh, in terms of providing service to the public and how much impact 
has the uh, budget situation had on that or is it likely to have? And uh, the significant factors that, um, that we were looking at, well, one of which is how to maintain uh, the current uh, ISO uh, rating and improve those areas that were rated as a class 10 or unprotected areas. Uh, the second was how to provide adequate protection from wildfire, uh, which obviously is a major uh, threat to the community every year now and, uh, and is uh, certainly one of the biggest uh, issues that uh, many of, the, of our residents um, are concerned about. And uh, how to maintain an adequate uh, uh, ambulance uh, capability. Uh, because that uh, that in particular is uh, one of our it's our our uh, biggest um, uh, uh, call volume, you know, uh, and uh, quite a bit of our efforts have to go into you know maintaining and, and staffing uh, the the ambulances to ensure that we have response to emergencies in the community. You know, after looking at all of these, uh, one of the, you know, what we really kind of focused on was the uh, ISO rating. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. One is that the ISO rating is very quantifiable, and in fact, it's something that's measured by an outside agency, by that office. They basically look at our fire department and they're analyzing it on a regular basis to say, you know, this is what, you know, you, you're doing you know, to our standards, and this is what you're not. The ISO looks at, you know, many aspects of firefighting. It does not look at the emergency medical side of things. However, uh, you know, they are very tied together in that <coughs> the staffing that we have here on a daily basis to uh, respond to fires, um, you know, respond, uh, you know, about eight times as often to the medical calls as they do to fires. So. Uh, you know, that is essentially factored in on that and, uh, you, know, it, um, you know, looking at the ISO rating and our capability to maintain a good rating should also reflect on our capability to provide staffing for medical calls and rescues and, and the other work that we do. Um, so, you know, after looking at that, uh, there were a number of things that, uh, that we determined on this. Uh, and one of those is the one that I discussed earlier, and that is that, you know, the staffing cuts, uh, now with uh, removing the, uh, the training officer position, that uh, equates to a 25% staffing cut uh, over two years. Um, and uh, it's a cut of uh, one-third of the uh, available response staffing uh, during the daytime as we're dropping from having those, uh, you know, those two full-time positions that were responsible, that were able to also staff, you know, Monday through Friday when our, our volunteers are not available as often. We're dropping back basically just to the two, uh, the two ambulance crew, and we don't have additional staffing to put on the engine. So essentially, we've dropped from four uh, people on on that engine during the Monday to Friday period to having two, uh, and that's going to that's going to impact that. Um, the second thing that we looked at was the, the age of our current fleet and, and the lack of our reserve apparatus and the lack of uh, reliability that we have as a result of that. As mentioned, um, you know, when we, we don't have a reserve apparatus um, and um, you know, each of the last two months we've had uh, one of our engines uh, go down for mechanical uh, failures. Um, you know, our mechanic does a great job of getting those back in service, uh, but in the interim, you know, we are, we are short apparatus. And uh, obviously, at some point, um, you know, those apparatus that are now 25 years old, you know, can't, we can't continue to keep operating them forever. Um, the third factor that we looked at was the <coughs> lack of funds to uh, basically put into that uh, capital replacement uh, plan. Um, you know, when we did, uh, when we looked at the total cost of, uh, of our apparatus fleet, uh, essentially we should be putting about $350,000 into that account each year to be able to maintain, uh, you know, the 20 apparatus that we have. Um, you know, we are not putting any money into that, and that is the reason that right now, out of our 20 apparatus, besides the three that are already 
you know, 24 and 25 years old, uh, there are six others that are also, you know, at or near their, uh, their end of their projected service life. Now, they're all obviously, um, you know, still functioning, uh, yeah, but, um, you know, we're, we're reaching the point where, you know, almost everything we've got is old. Uh, and uh, that's, that's going to catch up with us. Um, again, uh, you know, losing the tankers is going to be the biggest issue that we're going to have in terms of maintaining that tanker credit. Uh, and essentially, uh, that's because we need to be able to deliver uh, 250 gallons a minute for two hours uh, nonstop uh, with those tankers. And, um, you know, we would not be able to do that with just the, the two newer ones. Uh, we need to increase the capacity. Uh, to include the, you know, the, um, you know, the additional tankers so that we can continuously cycle them into to any test location or any fire that we would have. And then, you know, the biggest factor once again is the is the revenue one. Um, you know, we cut 13% uh, of the budget going from 2011 to 2012, 15% in 2012 to 2013, and now we're looking at a projection of an additional 6% cut going into next year. Um, you know, we're not only not going to be able to fund uh, the replacement of the apparatus that we have now, uh, we're not going to be able to continue to maintain the daily operations of the department at the, at the level that we have up until now. Uh, so, um, you know, we've taken a number of steps. Again, uh, you know, we've made those cuts by reducing staffing, uh, cutting benefits costs, um, you know, cutting uh, training costs, cutting maintenance costs. Uh, setting aside, um, you know, much of the repairs that we would be doing to the facilities, uh, but um, we're, we are going to have to cut again going into next year. Um, we've reduced the, the apparatus fleet by from 24 vehicles when I arrived to 20 currently, and um, I think that you'll be seeing a recommendation that, uh, that uh, we go ahead and discontinue uh, probably two more vehicles before the end of the year. Um, I think that uh, we're going to just start paring down to reduce our insurance and maintenance costs a little bit further. Um, you know, obviously those, uh, we're kind of reducing the fleet by removing the vehicles that are the least useful though. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, that, uh, we, we need the engines and we need the tankers and we need the brush trucks. So, uh, it's been scaling back on everything else that we've got that, uh, that has allowed us to do that. Uh, but there's a limit to where we can do that and not um, really impact our, our capabilities. Uh, and um, I think that uh, that's, um, that's something that we're going to really have to address is how, you know, how small are we, is this fire department going to end up being uh, you know, if we continue to cut. Um, again, right now, if we, would, uh, if we were to try to maintain the existing fleet, we need to be putting, and, and basically the way that we calculate that is you take the, the total cost of replacing the fleet today and, you know, basically divide it up over the number of years that you expect each piece of apparatus to last. And when we do that, it uh, comes out to $350,000 a year uh, to be investing into that, uh, into that fleet to maintain what we've got. Unfortunately, fire engines are very expensive and, um, you know, it adds up in a big hurry. Uh, with if we were to take uh, you know right now we're you know this year we have a 1.6 million dollar budget again next year it's probably be going to be closer to 1.5 if we were to try to pull that three hundred fifty thousand dollars out of out of the existing 1.5 million dollar projected budget for next year uh, again we'd be looking at scaling back by an additional 30 percent or 35 percent of all of our costs which, uh, after having already caught, cut close to 40%, I don't see how we could, uh, we could do that effectively. Essentially, we'd be returning to uh, a volunteer fire department with no uh, staffing during the day uh, to, to do that. Um, so, the, uh, you know, we, we have uh, been uh, looking at uh, both bond issues and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, possibility of a mill levy, and again, I think that we're going to probably not 
be prepared to make a recommendation until next month on that. Uh, we are trying to get uh, feedback from the public on, um, on those recommendations and, and how they would, uh, would approach those. Uh, you know, at, kind of the bottom line with a lot of this is that when we look at you know, the cost of, um, of losing the ISO rating, uh, you know, we would uh, you know, essentially see a, an increase uh, cost to all of the residents of the district that would be on the order of about five times what it would cost to invest in the department enough to maintain that existing uh, ISO rating. And um, we've, uh, we've gotten um, quite a bit of uh, information from the insurance companies, uh, the insurance agents around here that, uh, that reflect that. Um, what we'd be looking at there, you know, as you're, you're aware, is that uh, rather than seeing a $100 increase uh, for a home, you know, in terms of uh, funding the fire department back up to the level that we were a couple years ago, uh, they would see, you know, in the neighborhood of a six hundred to a thousand dollar increase in the cost of their fire insurance each year by losing those that rating. So this is a this is a pretty big financial impact to the public if we can't maintain the level of service to maintain that ISO rating uh, moving ahead. Is there, there's a survey that, have you had any feedback? We, we have uh, been getting quite a bit of response on, the, on that survey and uh, we've also been getting a lot of response in person and uh, by phone calls and emails from, from the public. And overwhelmingly to, to this point, uh, the public has been in favor of, um, of increasing the funding rather than uh, seeing that, uh, that impact uh, occur. Um, we're going to try to keep that, uh, that survey open for a while longer. Uh, we'd like to uh, continue to get uh, uh, more feedback from the public on, on uh, their thoughts on that. But um, you know, to date, uh, and again, not just from the survey, but from many of the you know, phone calls and emails and personal contacts that I've had, uh, uh, there's a lot of support for uh, trying to improve the, the situation here. The newsletter that's about to go out, that's also going to drive folks to the survey. Yes, we are. That is included in the, the, the current newsletter that's going out is uh, covering uh, wildland fire. It's a timely topic. Uh, and, uh, and it also does mention the survey uh, so that hopefully uh, folks will see that and get on there and, and uh, uh, give us their feedback on, on the situation. Is there any support with Rotary or the Business Council with distributing that information? I, uh, I know that we've, we've had uh, a number of people out in the community that have uh, said that they, they are going to uh, you know, uh, basically come out and, and, uh, and, and help support it and help, uh, help get the word out. Um, I think uh, you know, we're, I believe that uh, there's a group that's forming that's called the Friends of Elk Creek Fire that uh, is going to be uh, kind of um, handling that side of things. Uh, you know, so they're they are uh, kind of going to be more of the um, uh, drumming up the community support for the department. Is there a chair of that group that's been? Uh, I believe I believe that uh, uh, Jennifer Elanuski, who's a local insurance agent, has volunteered to, to head up that that, uh, and she has uh, been in contact with uh, quite a few of the other insurance agents around um, because obviously they're. They're seeing this issue uh, very dramatically already, uh, with uh, you know the the impacts of um, you know the the insurance issues that uh, we've seen over the past year, um, and the number of insurance companies that are now withdrawing from the market, the ones that are are uh, you know people are seeing dramatic rate increases, and uh, so obviously they have a very vested interest in in helping us make sure that we maintain as good an insurance rating as possible. Thank you. Again, I think once folks are realized we have one of the lowest fire mills in the entire state. So when I got involved, it appeared to amaze me the level of service we have here, considering our low mill. But this economy and, and all these budget problems and the lack of some long-range planning, not at any fault of anyone here. 
uh, kind of got us in this boat and everybody can see our budget. I mean, we're lean. We're, there's no wasted money here. Um, I think uh, those facts alone, and it doesn't take uh, a lot to realize paying a little more in a fire mill versus a lot in fire insurance. Uh, pretty easy to figure out. Um, but uh, and I think uh, this committee does their due diligence and gets all that information out. That's what the folks need to hear the facts so they can decide. So I think the survey is a good idea in getting this information out. So. Are you thinking that uh, come the uh, July meeting that we'll have the recommendations in? Uh, yes, if uh, if the district does want to move ahead with uh, with putting something on the ballot, uh, the July meeting would be the one that uh, at which the board would have to have to make that uh, final decision. Um, and. Uh, you know, we are we have uh, tossed a few things out, uh, but uh, we have a couple of other options that uh, we've been discussing that we wanted to make sure that uh, you know, we we address them entirely before um, before presenting a final recommendation to the board and hopefully uh, making that making that decision. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, Gary, do you have anything to add? Or? Uh, you know, after looking at all this long range plan stuff. I think the average community member around here pays more for their television cable bill than they do for police, fire, and EMS combined in the county. Okay. We're trying to get it on the cheap around here, and it's just not going to work. Okay. All right. We'll look forward to the recommendations. Any other questions on local service? Uh, old business? Any old business from the board? Okay, how about any new business? Okay, any citizens' issues tonight? Okay, how about a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 1848. <laughs>